I don't think that I've ever preached from this text that I can recall. I try to look back through notes and see if I've done it. Um, I'm, I am uh, not a spring chicken anymore when it comes to this. I was fortunate to have a lot of opportunities. And that doesn't mean that I've reached where I want to be. It just means that I'm in a different spot than I was before. So still room to grow, obviously. I don't think I've plateaued or reached a point. But it is interesting to look back through notes. And I find myself sometimes I have some physical copies. And I, I ran into that last night, or I guess really this morning, re- reading through some things. And I found some physical notes that I had. And just looking back on it, you know, 2013, and you're like, wow, a few things have happened since 2013. Um, Kaya was born that year, and now we've had Dex since then, and, you know, started the church or the fellowship here in 2019. So, you know, things can happen in the blink of an eye. You you don't realize how quick things go as your, uh, Luke was talking about just coming up this month is the two years that he's been at the church constantly instead of he was just helping us for a little bit. And he's, I think he was like, it feels like longer than that, right? It seems like two years is just such a short amount of time, but a lot has happened in two years. And, uh, you know, just reading back through notes is quite interesting, but I don't think I've ever taken the bulk of a sermon from Ruth, but I'm going to do that tonight. We'll start in Ruth chapter one, verse one. The name Ruth is very important to me. That was my grandmother's middle name. I was obviously very close to my grandmother. And uh, Miss Shaley Ruth back there, that's her middle name, which is why I call her Rue. I've been calling her Rue since she was born, before she was born. Uh, I said, this is going to be her name. This is what I will call her. Her name's Rue in my phone. So when people start talking about Shaley and I pull up my phone and try to, I'm like, there is no Shaley. Oh, yeah, it's Rue. You got to search by R. Still still there. And uh, just had this on my mind. Ruth, chapter one, was praying and felt it was very timely for our church. So verse 1 says, now it came to pass in the days, let me take a quick pause right out of the gate. If you're very familiar with this, that's fine. And if you're not, that's fine too. When we preach, it's important to make sure that everyone's on an even playing field because some people either have not heard certain things, some people have heard certain things not quite correct. So let's try to all get on the same, same page here. If it's just too simple for you, maybe you just needed a refresher, I don't know, but that's Now we're all on the same page. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, so prior to a king, that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elamech. I keep wanting to say, uh, what do I keep wanting to say? I think I keep wanting to say Amalek, so that E-L-I-M is throwing me off. Elimelech, the name of his wife, Naomi. These Both of these names, as I was reading through it, I kept wanting to say Amale- Amalekite is what I kept wanting to say. And then um, for Naomi, there was one of our customers had it flipped, the O and the A, and she went by Nomi. So I found myself when I was reading it out loud, and I would be like, Nomi. Nope, nobody's going to understand that. Naomi is how everyone else says that. Names are hard. What can I say? It's not even. All right, let's see if we can get through this tonight. The E name and the N name and the name of his two sons, Mahon and Shilon, Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continue there. Everybody on the same page? Can you read it up top? I don't know why. I'm just going to skip it. Naomi's husband died. And she was left and her two sons. Does that ever happen to anybody real quick? You ever get stuck on something and you just can't get away from it? It's a shame. Heather said, yeah. 
And she was left and her two sons, and they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelled about ten years. And Mehon and Chilon died, also both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. So Naomi and her husband and two kids went into Moab during a famine. They, her two sons married Orpah and Ruth, and then all the men died. Not a great place to be if you were a male. Don't know what was happening there, but all the men died. So Naomi said, look, you're relieved. Go back. Go find a new family. Just go start a new life. Don't worry about it. We're good. Go do it. And they actually both begin to weep and say, we're not going to leave you. We're going to be with you. We're going to stay with you. We want to be a part of what you have. And Naomi stressed again and said, listen, you got to move on. I'm old. I'm not going to have any more kids. And even if I do, they're going to be way too young for you to get married. What are you going to do? There's nothing for you to do about it. Go start a new family. And Orpah hugged her, wept, and went on. And Ruth I did not. So we'll pick up in verse 15. It says, And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said in verse 16, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from thee after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And whither, where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die. And where... There will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught, uh, but death part thee and me. So Ruth said, I don't want any part of any other God. I don't want any part of any other life. Wherever you are is where I will be. Whatever you do is what I will do. And they went back to Bethlehem. And it says that it was at the beginning of the harvest. So they were, people were going out and getting, uh, re- re- retrieving the harvest And the process began to happen that if Ruth was really going to be part of the kinsmanship, then one of their kinsmen should have married her. That was the, that would have been the order of operations. So Ruth goes and she begins to kind of pick up the leftovers, if you will, from the harvest of the fields that belong to a man named Boaz. And Naomi began to explain to Ruth that Boaz was a kinsman. So they began to talk about a strategy and Naomi began to advise Ruth and said, listen, if you can get favor with him, if you can just find yourself in the right spot at the right time, God's going to take care of it. He's going to bless you. So Ruth did so. She began to get close and Boaz uh, began to find favor in her and said, listen, don't go out out there. I've already instructed my young men, leave you alone. And I want you to come be a part of my maids, go out into their field, gave just so much favor to Ruth. And one thing led to another and you could see that uh, he begins to fall for Ruth quite extensively and decides that he would like to marry her. But there was a problem. The problem is he wasn't the closest one to Ken of, uh, of Naomi. So there was somebody else in the way. So as you're reading at the end of chapter 3, you will read that, uh, that Ruth begins to get a little antsy. And she's like, what, what am I going to do if this doesn't quite work out? And Naomi says, trust me, he is madly in love with you. It will be resolved by the end of the day. That's... That's pretty par for course, right? If you're, uh, if you're uh, most of the guys in here knows how that feels, you're like, okay, this one likes me. I will not let her leave. <laughs> yeah, there's a good chance another one won't like me. I need to make sure she marries me. I, don't, I can't risk it. I remember being um, 15 and I had a, a girl that I liked and it just didn't work out. And I was talking to, I think my grandpa about it actually, and whose birthday would have been yesterday. And I was just like, what am, what am I going to do? You know, what happens? What if no one ever likes me again? And he's like, ah, oh, there's plenty of fish in the sea. You know, <laughs> that, kind of, that kind of approach. Like, good point, good point. But you just don't want to risk it, you know. That's how, and he, I think Ruth was even concerned. She's talking to Naomi, and she's like, but what if he doesn't? And Naomi's like, listen, listen, by end of day today, all will be taken care of. Don't you worry about it. And sure enough, seems to be what happened in Ruth 4 and 7. It says, now this was the manner in former time in Israel. Now, sometimes there are things that were like a tradition 
and it's just goofy. This is one of those things, two of those things, that is just silly. It doesn't make any sense. You'll see where I'm going. So it says, here's what was happening in Israel, right? Concerning redeeming and concerning changing for to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor, and that was the testimony in Israel. All right, we got a deal. Here's my shoe. Whose idea was that? So now I have to walk back to my house without a shoe. It doesn't say that he gave me his shoe also, and then you just, what if you don't wear the same size? There's a lot of problems in this logic. I'm glad that that's not how we do business. Could you imagine that? Garth, whenever y'all bought our house, you just like take your shoe off and hand it to me. Done. All right. We're satisfied. Yeah. No, there's still money that happens after that. It's just, that's the contract. Here's my shoe. And you're like, all right, cool. Shoe. So that was the process. I'm just going to keep one shoe off. So the kinsman said unto Boaz, uh, let me back it real quick. So therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe and handed it to him. Let me time that real quick. I jumped ahead of myself. I had more scriptures. I skipped it a little bit. So here's what happened. Boaz gets the kinsman. He gets 10 elders, comes together and says, look, we have this problem. Naomi needs to sell her property. Ruth and, uh, Ruth also needs to. So uh, the kinsman says, yeah, I'll buy Naomi's property. But apparently Boaz had more money than the kinsman and kind of you know, play a little trickery and waited for him. So he said, I will buy it. And he goes, okay, if you buy that, you also have to buy Ruth's. And he said, can't do it. Won't be able to provide for myself. Please give me your shoe. So that's what happened. That's the, <laughs> that's the exchange of what happened. I can't do it. You buy it. So Boaz takes off his shoe, hands it in front of the elders, says, here's our, here's our business transaction. Take my shoe. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have given him a shoe. That's the, <laughs> that's the arrangement. So two things that are a bit odd. One is it's just like the highest bidder for the closest cousin. And two, you got to take your shoe off. So we, we did some silly things in our history. Moreover, Ruth, the Moabites, the wife of Mahan, have I purchased to be my wife to raise up uh, in the name of Feels weird, guys. Sorry. Uh, either one or the other, but both feel strange. Have I purchased to my wife to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of the place you are witnesses this day? That's the story of Ruth. I don't know how long that took. 15 minutes. We got through it. That's the story of Ruth. And all anybody's going to remember is that people used to use sh shoes for contracts. This is how it goes. Ruth was a Moabite. Now, what that means is Ruth was from Moab. Now, this was not insignificant. This was a very, very big deal that Ruth was from uh, the family of Moab. She was a Moabite. The children of Israel were not generally supposed to interact with them. I don't often read my notes to Heather ahead of time, but I told her about this. I thought it was funny. They were known, literally what they were known for, being wild, drunken, and ruthless. Ah, see? Ruthless. Ruth. Thanks. They were known for just living a life that wasn't acceptable, and the children of Israel were not really supposed to have anything to do with them, and their origins are pretty dark. Their origins go back to Genesis 19. Maybe you have heard of two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah which were so wicked that God literally had to destroy them. So Lot and his wife and children were there in Sodom. And God began to tell him, I'm going to destroy this city. Get out. And there was situation after situation after situation. It was bad, 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 bad. And in verse 15 of Genesis 19, it says, And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, if, if God spoke to me and said, I'm about to destroy Van Alsen with fire and brimstone, I would tell everybody that I know, love you guys, you should also run away. I do not want to stay here. But the angel of the Lord had to hasten Lot. What are you talking about? I'm about to destroy the city. Go away. 
It's like when you're trying to get your kids ready and you're like, we're leaving in 10 minutes. Please have your shoes on. Five minutes get there. We're leaving in five minutes. Please have your shoes on. We need to leave right now. Why are your shoes not on? I don't need shoes. What are you talking about? Ten minutes ago, we established the plan. You need shoes. Get out. There's a time. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. The city is going to be destroyed here. And Lot is having to be hastened by an angel. If there is an angel in my vicinity telling me that I should go somewhere, I'm pretty confident I will go immediately. So there was some very powerful spirits happening to influence Lot to have to be hastened. So in verse 16, it says, And while he lingered, my goodness, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. And they began, <laughs> the Lord being merciful unto him, I would say so. They brought him forth and set him without the city. Go away. Don't look back. Leave here. Don't even consider looking back. And God began to rain down brimstone and fire and destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. In verse 26, it says, But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And now Lot found himself in a predicament. It was Lot and his two daughters, and the nearest town was a town called Zor, and he did not feel safe going there. So he went up into the mountain. This is the true origins of the, of the Moabites. It is dark. They get up into the mountain. They get into a cave. And all of a sudden, the daughters realize, I'm going to have nothing to leave behind. Now, you have to understand in that time that if a woman could not bear a child, she was essentially worthless. And so they devised a plot. And this may be vulgar for some of our younger audience, but this is just what happened. They got him drunk and took turns raping him. Now you can, we don't use that phrase very often when it's a female to a male because it just seems inaccurate, but in this case it was accurate. It says that he was so drunk he didn't even know what happened. And they were just giving him wine and giving him wine and giving him wine. So in verse 36 it says, Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father, and the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab, and the same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the younger also bare a son and called his name Ben-Ami, the same is the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. The Moabites and the Ammonites caused havoc for the children of Israel all throughout history. You wonder why the children of Israel didn't like them. There was some animosity they went all the way back to their first cousin saying, why in the world would you rape your father so that you could have a baby? What is wrong with you? You bunch of inbreds. That's what they were. So there was some hostility between the lineage of Ruth. I would say her lineage has a few question marks when you begin to trace it back through it. Her history didn't have the effectiveness uh, of talking about uh, the children of Israel. And her, her lineage didn't have the effectiveness of talking about how Isaac came and beginning to testify about the promised child. And her lineage didn't have all these blessings that began to happen to the children of Israel. They went into Egypt. Egypt and later into slavery and God brought them out by the Red Sea through Moses and miracle after miracle after miracle and a promised land. They didn't have all that. Her lineage was nothing. Her lineage was she came from an inbred that was uh, caused by a rape. Her, her, her heritage was something that the children of Israel despised. And yet here she was finding favor. What that should tell us tonight is that you are not defined solely by your lineage. You are not solely defined by your past. You are not defined by your father, by your mother, by your own sins. You are not defined by the things that you have done, but what you are willing to do to change it. 
It doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are. Today is the day that you can either start your commitment with God or renew your commitment with God. And yesterday can be no more. There's no reason to have to deal with it anymore. So now, when we read Ruth chapter 1 and verse 16, understand the power that began to come from Ruth's mouth as she began to say, Entreat me not to leave, for I have never felt a God like this God. Entreat me that I don't have to walk away because I've never seen a blessing like this blessing. Does that ring a bell for anybody tonight? God, I don't want to leave. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you are, I will be. I will lodge where you lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. We have managed to water down the scripture to simply say it for wedding vows. But it's not really even about wedding vows. It's about us taking the time to make a commitment to God. See, here's the thing. Here's the thing. We are all very similar to Ruth. This scripture was a testament for a woman that in times past didn't have a God to lean on. This scripture is a testimony from a woman that didn't have mercy, but obtained mercy. Ruth's faithfulness, not only towards Naomi, but towards God provided to her with something that was very unique. See, the rest of the story of, of Ruth came at this expense. She married Boaz, and she got close to Boaz. They had a, ch a child, and the neighbors began to come around Ruth. And it says in verse 17 that the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying this is a, there is a son born to Naomi. Think about the story that Naomi got to share with her loved ones. I had two children, and we went in to a city that we shouldn't have been a part of. Hey, just take him up here. Everyone has kids. We understand. And she began to say, I went into this city, th this town that was just a bunch of inbreds. And I, my two children, I lost them both. But there was a woman that came back unto me. And if you read through the scripture carefully, you'll see that Naomi would say, these are my daughter-in-laws, my daughter-in-laws, my daughter-in-laws. And after this scripture in uh, verse 16 and 17, no more the rest of the way does she say daughter-in-laws. Instead you read and she says, this is my daughter, Ruth. This is my heritage. This is my lineage so the neighbors begin to come around and they begin to say there's a son born to Naomi and they called his name Obed he is the father of Jesse the father of David I'm telling you that not only David king of Israel but Jesus Christ the Messiah came from this woman Ruth that was born to a family that didn't didn't have any business being in the in the lineage of God so when you think that your past has anything to do with what blessing you get to have today, if you think for a second that your heritage has anything to do on the plus side or the negative side, I'm like fourth generation apostolic, but what my grandparents did doesn't make a, make a lick in my own relationship. I had to find out that my God was faithful to me. I had to pray to the point that my God delivered me. We get to decide today. I will be what you've called me to be, God. I will follow where you call me to follow. A people that had not obtained mercy. If that sounds familiar to you, it's because Peter wrote it in 1 Peter 2, and he said, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light which in times past were not a people, but now are the people of God, which have obtained mer had, had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. 
I will be what you call me to be. Somebody needs to either create that commitment or renew that commitment to God even here today. Lord, I will be what you want me to be. I will go where you want me to go. I will preach what you want me to preach. I will testify where you want me to testify. You are my God. Anybody declare that today. You are my God. As we go in to sing one more song tonight before we're dismissed, I encourage you to find a place and talk to the Lord and deal with him honestly. God, you see my sorrows. You see my failures. You see my shortcomings. You see the history of, of problems in my lineage. You see the adultery in my lineage. You see the pain in my lineage. You see the blessings in my lineage. You see all that happened. But today, I get a new walk with you. Today, I get a new talk with you. Hallelujah. Today, I get a new encounter. You are worth more than the sum of your failures today. Lord, I want to be right with you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Heal You have obtained mercy today. Oh, Lord, I receive the mercy. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, God.